Give him praise. Give him praise. Just say the name of Jesus. Just say Jesus. Say Jesus. 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 There is power, men, in the name of Jesus. There is no other name under heaven by which men are saved. What a privilege to be here tonight. Stay on your feet. We're going to pray. Uh, I don't know what it is about Tennessee, Chris. <laughs> uh, I was somewhere between Knoxville and Asheville, I think, yesterday coming over here. I was in the fast lane, and um, a song came on on my worship playlist, and the Lord just spoke to my mind and said, go ahead and get over. So I look in my rearview mirror. It's a clear shot to the shoulder. I get right over, and I just sat there on the side of uh, 40 and just wept at the goodness of God. He is so good. He is a good father. Amen. He is a good father. Amen. Amen. Father, we praise you. We thank you for your goodness and your mercy. God, that your kindness leads us to repentance. Oh, your mercy that endures forever. That you do not desire to give us that which we deserve. Lord, be in our midst tonight as you are. Intensify your presence in this place, not because we're deserving, but because it would please you. Father, we confess our sins to you as men of pride, of lust, of greed, of covetousness, malice, and slander. Jesus, we thank you for your cross, for your blood. Father, my prayer is the same as the sun's going down now as it was this morning when you awoke me. I pray that you would speak through me in such a way that these men's hearts are touched, that my brother's hearts are touched and encouraged because your word has been exalted above your name. I don't even understand it. Lord, we agree with it. Father, glorify yourself in this place tonight. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. <sighs> Let me find this mute button. You don't want to hear this. Chris, you type in this. Yeah, it's okay to be a mess before a holy God. He is not a God of disorder. He is not a God of experience. He is to be experienced. He's sovereign and He's holy. And He hides Himself. He reveals to us just exactly what we need to respond to Him. And uh, that's what we're going to look at tonight, quite simply. We're going to look at the living Word of God. We're going to be in Matthew, the 26th chapter. And I'm going to go ahead and tell you what I'm going to tell you. There's a couple of rules when it comes to speaking in public. I don't really like them, so I'm just going to go ahead and tell you what the point is tonight. The point is for you to understand that Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, is God's plan to save a lost and dying world. Amen? Amen? And that you and I are Jesus Christ's plan to reach 
a lost and dying world. Amen? And there's no amount of brokenness. There's no amount of patheticness. I think I just made up a word. You can't be bad enough for him to not use you. We need to come to terms with this. We need to agree with God on this. And that's really all that's necessary is obedience. Because you see, stated belief plus actual practice equals actual belief. Does that make sense? Yeah. Right. I like that. That's good. You guys can respond to me. I'm in flip-flops and a t-shirt. Y'all have shorts on. I, I completely lost the beard contest. That was all chandelier, by the way. I heard all the applause, and I went in there, and I, I, was, I was wanting to thank the ladies because, by the way, the ministry that I serve full-time, the body of Christ under, every man a warrior, exists. God has been explicit with all of us that are a part of this ministry. We know this. It exists because... Christian women have cried out to God for thousands of years, God help our men. And so uh, that's what I was going to say. Yeah, I walked in and Shannon goes, they're doing a beard contest, go up there. And I ran up there and as I got close to you, I was like, I'm in no shape to stand next to this glorious beard. And then the gentleman with the white beard, where was he? I thought he should have won. I love you, brother, but right there. Proverbs 16, 31 says, silver hair is a crown of splendor if it's attained in the way of righteousness. I love that silver hair. We want to look at the Word of God tonight, and we want to see, and we want to know in our hearts, and we want to understand that making disciples applies to us. I'm in the 33rd verse. We're going to read a lot of Scripture tonight. I hope you're okay with that, because you don't want to hear Adam North talk. You want to hear the Spirit of Truth talk. Does that sound good? I'll give you time to find your markers. You already there? Or turn your Bible on, whichever the case may be. Now, the first time I preached this message, I think, I was at the International Mission Board headquarters in Richmond, Virginia, the sending agency, training agency for all of the Southern Baptist Convention. I was preaching and teaching there at a conference on intimacy with Christ and purity with a fellow brother, Bob Ream. And um, I had four points. And I'd taken three men with me, and one of them, as I was preaching, found another point. And then uh, I preached this again in North Dakota somewhere, Dickinson, North Dakota, I think. Um, and I found another point. And tonight we have seven points. Now, I've never been to seminary, so I don't know about three points. Okay? You guys good with that? I'm a welder by trade with a high school education who just decided to pick this up and do it, not even though I didn't understand it, but especially though I didn't understand it. Let's look at the 33rd verse of Matthew 26. Now keep this in mind. Keep this in, your, in the back of your mind, forefront of your mind, whatever, as we're talking. I believe that the favorite thing that Matthew, the thief, the liar, the tax collector... The favorite thing he ever heard Jesus say was, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Because he wrote it down twice, okay? It's in two different chapters. It's in chapter 12. I'm not going to tell you the other chapter. You need to go read the book. Not implying that you haven't. Just go read it again, okay? He said it twice. And I want you to keep that in mind. God does not desire to give us that which we deserve. What we deserve is death, hell, and the grave. Jesus saved us from that. Now, if you're here tonight and you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, the moment you cried out to God and repented, well, you're still here. He didn't take you to heaven, now did he? Why would that be? He has plans for you. And this is what they look like. Verse 33, Peter answered and said to him, Even if all are made to stumble because of you... Now, wait a minute, listen, okay? We're not going to beat up Peter. Peter gets beat up all the time, right? We're not going to beat up Peter tonight because God wouldn't like that. We're not going to exalt Peter tonight because Peter wouldn't like that, okay? Okay. I will never be made to stumble. 
Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you that this night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. The seven things that I've identified, and by the way, if the Holy Spirit of the living God reveals something to you, please come and share it with me, okay? Share it with your brothers, okay? This will be a thorough teaching, but I'm not going to say it's going to be complete because I'm a man. Okay, so if you see something else in this text other than these seven points, let me know. Note takers, I'm a note taker, I get it. Don't take notes tonight, listen, okay? Just listen. I'll send you the points in an email. Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you that this night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. The first thing Peter did was despised prophecy. Do you see that? Do you know that all that has ever been said and done hangs on the law and the prophets. Jesus said so, right? All the law and the prophets hang on what two commands? Love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And the second is like it, not equal to it. Study to show yourself approved. Love your neighbor as yourself. First thing that Peter did was despise prophecy. Have you ever despised prophecy tonight, man? I have. And I have a good father that's forgiven me and made me a disciple and made me a disciple maker. Let's read on. Peter said to him, even if I have to die with you. Now, Jesus justifies this later on. We're going to look at that, too. I will not deny you. And so said all the disciples. Look at the very first word, Petros, the rock. Peter said to him, not the Spirit of God speaking through Peter said to him, not filled with the Spirit, Peter said to him, Peter said to him, even if I have to die with you, even if I, yeah, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. Peter stood in his own strength. Man, have you ever stood in your own strength? I have. I have a good father that's forgiven me made me a disciple and a disciple maker. It keeps getting better. Let's read on. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to the disciples, sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of, De of Zebedee. Who is that? Say it loud. Amen. We're in the house of God. This is the brethren. Shout it out. Amen. You got it. You got it. And he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. What did that look like? What does it look like for the Savior of the world, the Lord of heaven and earth, to be sorrowful and deeply distressed? Who would minister to him in this moment? I want you to really take these words in and I want you to feed on the bread of life. I want to go ahead and say this right now. Thank you, Lord. I hear you. Matthew 5, 6. Jesus is getting ready to give the greatest sermon ever preached on this planet. And one of the things he says is, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Man, if you're not hungry and thirsty for righteousness tonight, you need to fall on your face right now and you need to ask forgiveness. And you need to ask God to have mercy on you, to forgive you of your spiritual gluttony and fill you with righteousness, that which is right and wise. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear. He went a little farther and fell on his face in verse 39 and prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, this is famous, we all know this, what could you not watch with me one hour? Could you not watch with me one hour? The third thing that Peter did was he failed to pray. Men, the thing that we ought to do the most, if we're honest, for so many of us, myself included, we do the least. Prayer is the greatest privilege we have on this earth. Amen. Communion with the living God, our good Father. I failed to pray. I have a Father that's forgiven me and forgotten about it, made me a disciple and a disciple maker. Let's keep reading. Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the what is weak? 
the flesh is weak. Again, a second time he went away and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. So he left them, went away again, and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then he came to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand. And the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of Adam North. Everyone left him. Everyone abandoned him. He was all alone. The father turned his face away. Let that sink in for a minute. Jesus had never not had perfect communion with his father. And I can't imagine what this was like. My youngest son is 12 years old. And he's a better man at 12 than I was at 32. I promise you. And he did something two weeks ago to this day that I had to discipline him for, that I got to discipline him for, that I got to chastise him for. He came in my office. He sat down on the couch beside his mother. And I'm sitting in my office chair and my couch is low and my chair is not. And as soon as he sat down and I looked into his eyes, without even really thinking, I lowered my chair. I came down to his level. I asked him about the thing that he had said that was unholy. And he confessed to it with a trembling lip, with tears running down his face, no beard to catch him. And I got up and I held him. And I kissed his head. I can still smell his hair right now. And I'm a wicked, sinful man. Jesus says, you know how to give your sons good things. If they ask for a stone, you won't give them bread. I mean, if they ask for bread, you won't give them a stone. If they ask for fish, you won't give them a serpent. I want you to really stop and think tonight about how good it is that the Father sees fit, that we come and co-labor with Him, the God of the universe, to build something that will last for eternity, to invest in the life of another man, to teach him how to walk more deeply with Jesus Christ, to be a replica of the Son of God. Think about that for a moment. There is no wisdom. There is no understanding. There is no counsel against the Lord. Verse 46, rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. And while he was still speaking, behold, Judas, one of the twelve with a great multitude, with swords and clubs, came from the chief priests and elders of the people. Now his betrayer had given them a sign, saying, whomever I kiss, he is the one, seize him. Immediately he went up to Jesus and said, greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. But Jesus said to him, friend, I cannot get over that. I have read this, I don't know how many times, and I cannot get over that. The love of a Savior. You know Jesus' fate, right? He hanged himself, and his guts fell out in the field of blood. Jesus calls him friend. That absolutely blows my mind. The love of a Savior. Friend, why have you come? Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and took him. And suddenly, one of those, how many times has the enemy come upon you suddenly? 
one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword, struck the servant of the high priest, and cut off his ear. Now, we know from another gospel this was Peter. Okay? I'm not going to tell you which one. Go read all four of them. You cannot spend too much time in the Word of God. Don't read any other book more than you read the Word of God. I'm not good at these 66 enough. I want to, I want to live here. I want to stay here. I want to move and breathe here. And what did Jesus say? Put your sword in its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Peter agreed with the world. They came with swords and clubs. What did Peter do? Pull the sword. Have you agreed with the world tonight, man? Have you sided with the kingdom, the prince of the power of this age? I have. I am so sure that my Heavenly Father has forgiven me, that I am a disciple of Jesus Christ, and that I'm a disciple maker. It keeps getting better. You know it does. Or do you think that I cannot now pray to my Father and He will provide me with more than 12 legions of angels? Now I want you to understand this. There are four angels that are coming when God does this thing called the end of the world. Do you hear that? Do you know how many is in a legion? 12 legions of angels is 60,000 angels. Do you know that no man has ever killed an angel? Let's figure out what our Savior's saying here. This is God's will that I go and die on a cross for your sins so that you can be in glory with me forever. And in the meantime, while you're still here on earth, you can get practice for ruling and reigning with me in that coming age. Amen? That's what Jesus is saying here. How then could the Scriptures be fulfilled that it must happen thus. Remember Peter's first downfall? What was it? What was it? Yep, you're right. He despised prophecy. The prophets must be fulfilled, he says. In that hour, Jesus said to the multitudes, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to take me? I sat daily with you teaching in the temple, and you did not seize me. But all this was done. Why? That the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Do you know that you live... Your very sustenance is the Word of God. We don't live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then all the disciples forsook Him and fled. Verse 57, And those who had laid hold of Jesus led Him away to Caiaphas. Oh boy, this is whew, the high priest. Where the scribes and elders were assembled. But Peter followed him at a distance to the high priest's courtyard. And he went in and sat with the servants to see the end. The fifth thing that I see here that Jesus, I mean that Peter did, was he distanced himself from Jesus. You see that. Men, have you ever distanced yourself from your Savior? I have. And I know beyond the shadow of a doubt that I'm forgiven that I'm a disciple, and that by His power, by His grace, I'm making disciples. Now the chief priests, the elders, and all the council sought false testimony against Jesus to put Him to death, but found none. Even though many false witnesses came forward, they found none. But at last, two false witnesses came forward and said, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. What's that going to be like? What's it going to be like when Jesus returns? When he splits that Carolina blue sky over my head wide open? When he shakes this rocky top to the core? Are you going to be found resolute that you are forgiven and free and that you've been charged to go and make disciples who go and make disciples? Is that how you're going to be found? Verse 62, And the high priest arose and said to him, Do you answer nothing? 
What is it these men testify against you? But Jesus kept silent, and the high priest answered and said to him, I put you under oath. (laughs) Do you believe this? Are you reading this with me? I put you under oath. This is amazing to me. A wicked... Think about this. Every single second of Jesus' existence here on earth with us was an affront to his godness. It was an insult to his very existence. And yet he considered it not something to be grasped, equality with God. He laid his deity aside to come down here and show you and me how to live as men. And now he's being questioned by one of these sinful men. I put you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, It is as you said. Nevertheless, I say to you, Hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Amen. Amen. Then the high priest tore his clothes, saying, He has spoken blasphemy. What further need do we have of witnesses? Look. Now you have heard his blasphemy. What do you think? They answered and said, He is deserving of death. Then they spat in his face and beat him, and others struck him with the palms of their hands, saying, Prophesy to us, Christ, who is the one who struck you? They don't even know what prophecy is. Prophecy is a declaration that that which has not happened yet will happen. You see it? You see that? You see, how, you see how stupid they are? How ignorant they are? They slapped him and then they said prophesy. It doesn't even make any sense. He took this for you and me so that we can sing his praises 10,000 times 10,000 years. But before that, go and make disciples. Verse 69, Now Peter sat outside in the courtyard and a servant girl came to him saying, You also were with Jesus of Galilee. But he denied it before them all, saying, I do not know what you are saying. And when he had gone out to the gateway, another girl saw him and said to those who were there, This fellow also was with Jesus of Nazareth. But again he denied with an oath, I do not know the man. And a little later, those who stood by came up and said to Peter, Surely you also are one of them, for your speech betrays you. Your accent betrays you. You guys don't turn when I talk like this, like a dog hearing a siren off in the distance, because I grew up right here at the end of the Appalachia. When I go to North Dakota or New York or Pennsylvania or D.C., they do that. They look at me funny. They look at me real funny. They identified him. He was given away. And then he began to curse and swear, saying, I do not know the man. Immediately a rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the word of Jesus who had said to him. Look up at me. The sixth thing that Jesus did was identify himself with the enemy. Not once, not twice, but three times. Have you ever identified yourself with the enemy? I have. My good Father has forgiven me. That is as far as the east is from the west. And I'm a disciple of His only begotten Son making disciples. In verse 75... Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So he went out and wept bitterly. The seventh thing, he fell. The rock upon which Jesus said to him, he's never said this to any man in this building, and he never will. He changed his name. He said, you're the rock upon which I'm going to build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That's a promise that Jesus made to Peter. Jesus has also made a promise to all of us. It's found in Matthew 18. 
And what Jesus says is, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. We're pretty good at that in the United States, right? Africa, Guinea-Bissau, okay? Those are fun places to go for a week, okay? Those are fun places to go and live and stay. I have many friends that do that abroad. You know what? This is a nation too. Red, white, and blue is a nation too. God's a respecter of no man. He's no more impressed with this nation than he is with any other. He loves every soul that's here just like he does everywhere in the world. Man, I want you to know tonight that the field is white for harvest right here in this so-called buckle of the Bible Belt. I want you to know, too, that that's not an endearing term in the heart of a sovereign God. Where are the disciples? Where are the men that cry out, crucify me upside down, I'm not worthy to die the same way my Lord and Savior did because I denied Him? Where are those men? I can find plenty that are looking at pornography. I was one. I can find plenty that are beating their wives down. Verbally, at least, I was one. I can find plenty that are denying their sons and daughters the truth of the living word and not teaching them how to walk deeply and consistently with God in their own home. I have to look really hard to find disciples. What about you? Man, let's be real tonight. I want you to take stock of how you're spending your time. The greatest privilege you have is prayer. Make no mistake about it. And I think the second greatest privilege that we have is found, it's it's hidden. The Lord says, I can seal a matter for a king to search out. Has the Lord shown you anything new in Scripture today? This week? This month? You need to ask then. You need to seek. You need to knock when you do this with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. You'll find in Proverbs 16, 9 says, A man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. There was a man named Pharaoh, and his heart planned his way, and the Lord directed his steps. He's in hell now. There was a man named Abraham, and his heart planned his way. And the Lord directed his steps. We're called his sons now. Amen? Men, you are given a privilege every single second of every day as to how you're going to spend your time. And I want you to know if you've despised prophecy, if you've stood in your own strength, if you've failed to pray, if you have distanced yourself from Jesus, if you have identified with Satan himself, If you have fallen, he is a good father. There's nothing he can't redeem, nothing he can't clean up. It's all or nothing, amen? He can do it all or he can do nothing. Now, I want to, we went down, didn't we? We went down deep just now, didn't we? Was that good? Go to John 21. This is the beloved one's gospel. Turn with me to John 21. And I'm going to let Jesus illustrate this for you. Breakfast by the sea. It's been a heavy-duty night so far, hasn't it? I'm not sorry. I woke up this morning. I told Chris I was going to preach on something last night when we were eating supper at uh, our three-and-a-half-hour supper. I tell you, when the brethren gets together, it's just good. I never spent time with this man before in my life, but we spent three and a half hours last night in communion and prayer and breaking bread, as he said. And I I went to the bathroom and I I came back and I said, this is what I'm sensing that the Lord wants me to speak about. And the theme is the same. The theme is that God is good. Romans 2, 4 says that it is his goodness that leads me to repentance. He is a God of wrath. Be sure of that. He is a God to be fearful of, be sure of that. And it's His goodness that leads us to repentance. Isn't that good news? 
We're going to look at what God become flesh looks like when he does a good thing and restores a man and says to him, you will go and make disciples. John chapter 21. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And in this way, he showed himself. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, what, what did he say? Say it out loud. I'm going fishing. I'm going back to what I did before he walked along this shore and called me by name. Because I just suck. I ain't worth a flip. I can't do it. Jesus has got another idea. A capital I Dia. They said to him, we're going with you. They went out and immediately got into the boat. And that night they caught what? What does John 15, 5 say? Wasn't, apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from me, you can do no thing. Apart from me, you can do not one thing. Wasn't there another time where Jesus said, you're on the wrong side of the boat and the nets broke? But when the morning had now come, Jesus stood. What would it have been like after we get through reading this text? Just think, what would it have been like for Peter to, to live the rest of his life here on earth before he was crucified upside down, as church tradition tells us, and think back on this moment. Think back on that night when he went out fishing and caught not one thing. Man, it's a good thing to think back about when you despised prophecy when you called down curses, when you distanced yourself from God, when you aligned with the evil one, when you fail. It's a good thing to think back on that and to praise God for His mercy. Amen? That is a good thing. The only right you have and the only right I have is to be broken before a holy God. Chris came up and asked me back there before we got started, Adam, are you ready tonight? I said, I am. I said, I'm broken. That's how I know I'm ready. Amen? Then Jesus said to them, oh, verse 4, But when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, Children, have you any food? They answered him, No. And he said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. Here we have it. You can do nothing apart from me. So they cast, and now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved, who's that, said to Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he had removed it, and plunged into the sea. But the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from land, but about 200 cubits. Nor were they crazy. They didn't want to put on more clothes and jump in the water. No, I'm just kidding. It doesn't say that dragging the net with fish. Then, as soon as they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals there and fish laid on it. Now, I know you need a fire to cook a meal. But in one of the Gospels, it tells us, doesn't it, that there was a fire there and that Peter took note of the fire. In fact, they were warming themselves by the fire. You guys remember that? right before that rooster crowed the third time. He's a God of details. He is a God who cares about every detail of your life. He's a Father who wants to hold you, who wants to cry with you, who wants to hold you in His arms and repair everything. Jesus said to them in verse 10, Bring some of the fish which you have just caught. Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to land full of large fish, 153. I am going to ask the Lord about that number when I get to heaven. Because I have no idea the significance of it. And although there were so many, the net was not broken. 
Jesus said to them, come and eat breakfast. There was the time the net broke. What did Jesus say to him then? I'll make you fishers of men. Okay? Do you believe every promise of God has already come to pass? He's not a part of space and time. Think about this with me for a minute. He's eternal. He's immutable. He's omniscient. He knows everything. God's never learned anything. Okay? He's omnipresent. He's never gotten somewhere and gone, oh, wow, this is nice. Hey, son, go get Peter and uh, James and those sons of thunder. I got to show them this. Okay? And he's omnipotent. He's all-powerful. These are five absolutely, positively exclusive traits of the living God. Think about that. He's never learned anything. He's never been somewhere he's not been. He's never increased or decreased in power. He's sovereign. He's eternal. And he cares about every detail of your life. When Jesus spoke those words, I think it was said it was, said it was Matthew 28. It's Matthew, uh, Matthew 18. It's Matthew 28. When Jesus spoke those words and he said, Go to every nation, baptize in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. That was a three-part command. And we're really good at the first two. We're not so good at the second or the third. And rightly so. They're all equally important. Do you believe... I have a question I want to ask you tonight, man. Do you believe that the Great Commission applies to you? You all nodded and said amen when I said that Jesus is God's plan to save a lost and dying world, and you and I are Jesus' plan to reach a lost and dying world. You don't have to answer me. Answer your Father. What are you doing that proves it? Where are your replicas? Where are the men who call you spiritual father? Where are the men who look at you and say, because of this man, because of John, because of Chris, because of Larry, because of Steve, because of Brian, I'm a soul on fire. Do you believe that Jesus can fulfill that promise? in and through your life. See, this is God's desire. He flows around every Christian. His desire is to flow through us. His desire is to flow through our righteousness, that which is right and wise. Man, how many of you know five verses on walking with God? I know you do. You better. How many of you want to walk deeply and consistently with God all the days of your life and leave a legacy of righteousness? I'm not here to beat you up. I'm here to preach the Word of God. Let's try it again. How many of you have wives? Raise your hands. That's 80% or more. How many of you, Paxton, you can't answer this either. How many of you know four verses on how to treat your wife? Three, two, you're thinking about it? That's okay. There's no condemnation in Christ, by the way. We know John 3.16. We need to read the whole story. There's, there's five more verses there. John 3.17 says there's no condemnation in Christ. Okay? If you're here tonight with me, you're my brother. We've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer us who lives. It is he who lives in us. Amen? That's what we're talking about here tonight as grown men. Amen? How many of you know that a marriage is what is supposed to reflect Christ and His bride to a lost and dying world. Amen. And yet the vast majority of us in this room tonight don't know four verses on how to treat our wife. <clears throat> Let's try it again. How many of you know three verses on raising children? How many of you have children? Raise your hands. Thank you, guys. You got, by, at this point, usually when I'm talking about this, the guys are going... How many of you know three verses on how to train your children in righteousness? 
How many of you want your children to walk deeply and consistently with God and trust Him for greater things than you? Because that's the idea that each generation is getting better, shining brighter under that perfect day. There are 31,104, 5 or 6, depending on which version you're carrying, verses in the Bible. I want to ask you tonight, do you know Jesus? Do you know Jesus? Now, I want, we're taking a segue here because the Holy Spirit is in our midst. Turn to Revelation 19.13. Father, we praise you and thank you. You guys can keep turning. You don't have to bow your heads. You know why you bow your heads and close your eyes? Because it was not kosher to look upon the Pope while he prayed. That's one that skated through the Reformation. It's a tradition of men that's made it into our... Have you ever seen a picture of Jesus with his head bowed and his eyes closed? Think about that. Where's God? He's not down here. I may be up here so you can see me, but there's a level playing field at the foot of the cross. Okay? He is above us. I'm going to keep praying. Father, I pray that you would have mercy on us. Father, I pray Ezekiel 18.4 over every soul in this room. That you have declared, God, that all souls are yours. Father, have mercy on us. Let us see and know and understand that which is true. Amen. Jesus, we love you and we praise you. Will you pierce hearts here tonight? Revelation 19, 13 declares he was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. And what is his name? His name is the word of God. I will ask you again, do you know Jesus? Then there was a man named Peter who was a true apostle. He walked with Jesus. He talked with Jesus. He sat with Jesus. He slept with Jesus. He ate with Jesus. He breathed the same air as Jesus. You can't deny him. You can't turn your back on him any more than this man did. And Jesus restored him. Let's finish this story. Amen. Verse 13, Then Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and likewise the fish. This is now the third time Jesus showed himself to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Tend my sheep. Who did Jesus come to first? Two camps in all of creation. You can divide them, Jew and Gentile. Amen? Who did Jesus come to first? The Jews. Peter was God's single chosen man upon which his only begotten son would build the church. I've said that a few times tonight. Do you understand that we're sitting here tonight, those of us who know Jesus as our Lord and Savior, because of Peter? Do you believe that? I hope you do, and I hope that gives you great hope in our good, good Father. 
He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? Proverbs 30 verse 5 says, every word of God is flawless. Do you see this here? Most of you know why he asked three times, right? Because Peter denied him three times. Again, I'll say this. God is concerned with every detail of your life, brother. He is concerned with every detail of your life. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Most assuredly, I say to you, here it is. When you were younger, you girded yourself and walked. I love how Jesus he just finishes where he starts. He's the Alpha and the Omega. Everything is complete and perfect and pure. Do you see that? What was the first thing Peter did? He despised prophecy. The Son of Man is getting ready to prophesy right now over Peter. Pay attention. Most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. In other words, you were a man and you did what you wanted to do. Proverbs 16, 9 makes sense. A little more now, doesn't it? Man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. But when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke, signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, Follow me. Man, it has been appointed unto each one of us wants to die and then the judgment when that day comes if you're sitting in this room and you know jesus christ as your lord and savior you have one task your life is to love him with all your heart soul and mind there's nothing greater it's not to study him it's not to sing about him it's not to teach about him or preach about him we need all those things but jesus said love me with all your heart soul and mind and your task and let me tell you you're an unworthy servant the disciples had gone and done some things and they'd had some success because they had done it the way that jesus told them to and in luke 17 10 they got praised and jesus said here's your response whenever people praise you this is what you say. I am an unworthy servant who is merely fulfilling the task assigned to me. Men, your task is to go and make disciples who go and make disciples. Your task is to replicate. Do you believe that God can do that in you? The musicians are going to come. We're going to sing a song. I don't know what your plans are for the rest of the night. I want you to forget about it, though. The Bible tells us plainly, I want, I want to handle this seriously because it's a serious thing. The Bible tells us that it is a snare. It's a real sneaky trap. It's a, it's a very delicate, well-disguised trap. It's a snare for a man to devote rashly something as holy and then reconsider his vows. If the living God has spoken to you tonight, if you've heard in your heart, if you've heard in your mind that the great commission of Jesus Christ applies to you, this altar is open. I want you to come. I want you to pray. If there's forgiveness that you need to seek from the Lord or from a brother, I want you to do that too. But here's the one thing I want you to do more than any. I want you to ask God, beg God, because that word ask really means beg. Beg Him to be pleased to empower you to go and make disciples who go and make disciples, to replicate. You've heard this before, and it's true. He doesn't need a perfect vessel, He needs a willing vessel. I want to tell you too, if you decide to do this tonight, some of you have already decided, I know that. If you decide to do this tonight, to commit your life to walking deeply and consistently with God and teaching other men how to do so, there are men at this church that can help you do that. 
You see, there's a biblical precedent for caring for another man's soul. Jesus said, greater love has no man than this. Than what? He lay his life down for his brother. You know why? This is easy. Do I look comfortable up here to you guys? This is not hard. What's hard is sitting in the ash heap with a man on, at 11 o'clock on a Tuesday night while he's confessing to his wife that he went to a prostitute. And this man is a fellow church member of yours. He's a brother in Christ. That's hard. Listen, guys, he will equip you. His grace is enough. Will you come and will you claim this promise? I'm not going to ask you to do this right where you are. Everyone Jesus saved, as far as we have record of it, he did it in public and there were witnesses. Okay? I want you to come forward tonight and I want you to cry out to your good father knowing that there's no condemnation in him and there's nothing he can't forgive. If you're here tonight and you're burdened, I'm looking out and I'm seeing a lot of silver hair tonight. If you're burdened because you feel like there's time that's been wasted, there's nothing he can't forgive. He's the great mathematician. He will multiply your days. Just come and cry out to him. Stand to your feet. This altar is open. I want to say this before we go into this song. Amen. Come on. Come forward. He's a good God. He will empower you to do this. He can't not. It's a promise He's made. It's a promise He's fulfilled from before the foundations of the earth. Every promise of God is true. We've just yet to step into it. Amen? Every promise of God is true. He will equip you. You have pastors here whose sights are set on making disciples. I'm not kidding myself. I've preached a sermon tonight. God has anointed my words. Jesus never made a disciple from the pulpit. He lived with men. He breathed with men. He walked, talked, ate, slept with them. And there's a biblical precedent for that. We have it. And we can teach you. You have a man here that God has placed in your midst. Acts 17, 26 says that God has determined the time and the place. Come forward, brother. Yes, that every man shall live and move and breathe and have his being upon this earth. And God has given you Chris Ackerson. He's the Tennessee State Director of Every Man a Warrior. He knows a thing or two about investing in a man and making it last for eternity, caring for a man's soul. He knows a thing or two about that. Your pastors have this same ability, okay? Won't you come to the altar, men? Won't you come? Let's worship a holy God. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love and through the storm. He is Lord, 
to begin to replicate. Does that sound good? It was God's idea that ministering to men be practical. Because you see, when we do the practical, He does the profound. He doesn't ask us to be God. When we live by His living word in the mundane, that's when miracles happen. Amen? The only thing necessary is that you have a heartbeat. That's it. I want to remind you that you are made full of fear and wonder in the image of the living God, the sovereign, uncreated creator of all things. You are capital D designed to replicate. Come back tomorrow morning. Let's talk about that. Father, we praise you. We thank you for being in our midst. God, I thank you. I thank you for my brother Gary. I thank you for my brother Chris. God, I thank you that you have arranged all the parts of the body the way that you see fit. And that this is beautiful tonight. God, I thank you that you love Chattanooga, Tennessee, that you love this valley, and that you have all authority over it. And you're waiting for us to step into, well, not me, Lord, because you put me in Trinity, but you're waiting for these men to step into their God-given design and replicate. Go and make disciples who go and make disciples. Father, I pray that you would continue to have mercy on us tonight, that you would not let these men rest until they have peace in their hearts, that your promise can be fulfilled in their life of going and making disciples. Jesus, thank you for feeding us tonight. You are the bread of life. We love you. And we praise you. And all the sons of God said, Amen. 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 Two things before you leave uh, tonight. We're going to dismiss in just a moment. Um, if you're a guest, I want to thank you for coming out. So we have some folks that come from the other parts of the state, matter of fact, uh, even from Georgia, and uh, to be a part with us now. We appreciate that. You do us a favor. Uh, uh, if you'd like to be on a mailing list uh, with our men's ministry, we have uh, a monthly uh, get-together fellowships. We have speakers that come in and uh, address that. We have men, uh, men's outreach, and so you can take one of the cards that are in the front. It's, a, it's an offering envelope. Don't put an offering in it, though, okay? Just put your name on it, and uh, you can drop it off in the back on your way out. Just put it in there, and if you'll give us a way to an uh, email so that we can contact you and kind of put you on our mailing list. One of the ways you can uh, kind of keep up with this as well, if you go to Facebook and look at uh, Men's Ministry of Stewart Heights Baptist Church, you can go there, like it, and kind of keep abreast of what's going on. Guys, let me just say this. Uh, um, our culture is shifting, isn't it? I mean, things are changing. They're changing dramatically. Uh, I, I never dreamed I'd see in our generation uh, that uh, they try to feminize men. That's what they want to do out there today. They want to feminize men. Thank you for the three amens, the rest of you guys. We're scared to talk about it, all right? Might offend somebody or whatever. There's two genders, male and female. Thank you right there. I, I love you, brother. Friends. Yeah, I have him up in Saudi Daisy. He goes down for me. But uh, uh, men need to be men. And uh, there needs to be some leadership. Uh, just came from the, from the Southern Baptist Convention, just had their meetings, and they talked about um, uh, uh, leadership that's, that's lacking out there. And uh, it's kind of interesting. Most churches have a lot of women who take the lead, and they do all the ministries and do all the things. And, and God has raised up men as well. And men need to step up and be leaders in the church. Can I get an Amen. amen. And uh, again, with our culture shifting the way it is, uh, we need to stand on principle and what the Word of God has to say. Tomorrow morning at 830, I'd love to have you be a part. You can, you can do this. Be a part at 830 tomorrow. Have some breakfast. We're gonna be, we'll be done by 10 o'clock. But I want to encourage you to come out and be a part of every man, a warrior tomorrow morning, and be a part of that. So it'll be at 830, and uh, we'll get you out by 10 o'clock. I want to thank you guys for coming and being a part. And God bless you. See you tomorrow at 830. See you. Bye. God bless you.